Okay, how nice that by some mistake you all, all showed up here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the context of uh, bringing back extinct sp species in, into Europe. I think that has been talked a lot uh, about today. And um, I'm fortunate enough, to, enough because uh, I've always uh, had a bit interest in uh, megafauna and large animals. I've been very crazy about Africa all my, all my life. And I'm fortunate enough, uh, uh, fortunate enough to have made my work uh, so a little bit uh, my hobby here. First of all, I will talk a little bit uh, about what we are doing in Europe. And then I will uh, talk about a little bit our, about how we are doing things, how we are de-extincting species, uh, how about the reintroduction, uh, reintroducing species, and finally, and most importantly also, why we are doing that. Huh? Okay, the first thing is talk a little bit about the context. The context in Europe is called rewilding, just like you had a uh, whole discussion about rewilding, uh, Pleistocene rewilding in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Americas a uh, few years ago. We have also have a, a rewilding setting, but uh, our reference is the Holocene. And rewilding is, is uh, uh, trying to uh, bring large areas back to a natural state. So it means reviving and storing uh, areas and protecting them. And the second thing is uh, bringing back large mammals and keystone species back into the ecosystem. Because after a lot of research, we learned that uh, Europe, uh, Europe wasn't all a closed canopy forest, it was a more a parkland landscape with diversity of uh, uh, habitats. And uh, large animals, they shaped their habitat and they were part of it as well. When we're talking about extinction in Europe, I can give you one good example of what happened. In Europe we have bison as well. <laughs> and, um, and here is an example on, on the map, uh, what you see is that in the Holocene, the bison were uh, 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 still very much spread throughout uh, Europe and, uh, and Asia. In the Middle Ages, uh, the aerial had shrunk uh, uh, for a large bit. In the 20th century, just about uh, 100 years ago, it had shrunk to two uh, small pockets in the Caucasus in Poland. And the whole bison population has been brought from the uh, brink of extinction from just 12 animals. Okay, and from the, for the aurochs it's even worse because we lost the species completely in uh, 1627 AD. Okay, but we do have some uh, uh, large animals left. We, we have the, the, the European bison that I was talking about. We have the red deer. We also have the wild ass. I will uh, explain to you why we still have it. <laughs> and uh, we also have uh, lost a few animals, uh, at least seemingly we lost, uh, we lost them because yeah, the aurochs is still present in uh, all, all the variants of cattle breeds that we have today. Uh, the water buffalo is also uh, still uh, present in, in their varieties in Europe uh, also as well. And the wild horse, well actually after a lot of research, we learned that uh, we still have direct descendants of the wild horse living uh, in Europe. So, in, uh, um, instead of uh, cloning techniques in, in uh, Europe for uh, the aurochs and for the water buffalo, we are using different techniques. One of them is called uh, backbreeding. That means that you uh, selectively uh, breed all, uh, the, all the known traits of a certain animal into one animal breed. And the other one is uh, selection. I mean, for the wild horses, it was uh, perfect because uh, after a lot of study of uh, archaeology, uh, historical uh, uh, records, uh, genetic studies, we learned that we actually have some horse ecotypes that are directly related to uh, ancient wild horse uh, populations. So at least on paper, Paper, that means the de extinction as well. And the same goes for the wild ass that uh, is now living in Asia. We learned that the uh, uh, European wild ass genetically fully clusters within ancient and present day uh, Asiatic wild ass. So essentially, we're talking about the same species. So, in another fact, it means that the European taxon <laughs> is extinct as well because it never existed, uh, existed as such. Okay, so how do we get a knowledge? We have uh, we try to uh, bring together a lot of scientific disciplines, like uh, uh, historical records. We still have, from the Aurochs, we have a lot of historical records from uh, the Middle Ages, still talking about behavior, talking about their, uh, what they looked like, what they ate like, uh, what their interaction there was with other animals, with uh, humans. We have uh, isotope studies from bones, so we know what they ate and what kind of environment they lived in. We have archaeology, so we can reconstruct their skeletons and the way they looked. 
uh, we have uh, uh, historical pictures, we have cave paintings, we have uh, cave art, and we also uh, have people studying the art for about 15 years, like Sis van Vuur. Okay, so how does this uh, back breeding work? Um, from all the knowledge we gathered from all the sources, we uh, set up a, se a list of uh, selection criteria, and um, we um, researched a lot of uh, old primitive cattle breeds that uh, we still have in Europe. Uh, they live feral, they're used to wolf predation, uh, etc. And um, we uh, brought all those cattle breeds uh, we're trying to bring together, cross-breeding them, uh, and then um, try to bring all the correct characteristics of the Arox back into one animal breed. And here you have some examples like uh, Maranesa coming from northern Portugal, uh, which are uh, the cows are cool killed by wolves every year. There's some Maramanas from uh, Italy. You have Limia from, from Spain. And of course, the crossbreds are running around as well. So uh, uh, with every generation, we try to come closer to the original Arox. OK. The program in action is very simple. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, do uh, artificial insemination, and it's also a practical thing because uh, sometimes you're talking about cattle breeds that are so rare that the only thing we can get our hands on is, is stored semen, uh, for instance. And uh, we can also uh, create embryos. Yeah, you can make crossbred embryos and place them into low productive uh, Holstein cows. And that's what you see here. You have to rope cattle, inseminate them, etc. Okay, and um, uh, when we are going to reintroduce animals, we have a, what we call a spatial strategy. I mean, this slide has a lot of text on it, but the uh, simplified the story goes, you start in a small nature reserve where you can control the animals, where you can do your artificial insemination, embryo transplantation. Uh, you can uh, do, uh, do heavy selection on uh, unwanted and wanted animals. Uh, then you uh, move the fences. So the uh, areas get bigger. Uh, you uh, let go of the artificial insemination. Natural breeding uh, starts occurring. You try to build up social herds. Uh, the, so it could mean that you have to take a lead cow by the hand, show her where the wa water holes uh, are, etc. They have to get the knowledge of the terrain, etc. And then in large areas, I mean, then we're talking about the really large rewild areas, you can let go. Maybe a little bit of a selection, because of, uh, you will see at least the first 10 generations, you will, you will see that domestication mark will pop up uh, uh, everywhere in the herd. But OK, th those can be eradicated by selection, and then it's hands off. And the second thing you need to do is that uh, we are not only creating individuals, we also try to uh, create uh, populations. That means social herds, like I just uh, told, uh, told you. They have to interact with their ecosystem. They have to be taught uh, certain things. And uh, eventually, uh, yeah, uh, they will be assimilated into the ecosystem and interact with the ecosystem and also form their own ecosystem. OK, and then reintroduction into practice. Well, these are, the, I think, two nice uh, images. One of them is releasing Saigesa cattle into the Campanarios Reserve in Spain. Uh, where, where we just uh, started a new herd. And the second thing is, uh, I think this is releasing bison in, into the Caucasus. That's how we do it. OK, and why, why do, do we do it? OK, the intrinsic value is, of course, uh, uh, we uh, killed off a lot of animals. I mean, especially for the re recently extinct uh, animals like the aurochs. They have been killed off by uh, animals, uh, by humans, uh, because of uh, habitat loss, because of uh, hunting, etc. And what we try to do is uh, build an, a complete eco ecosystem. And like I just explained to you, uh, uh, herbivores were essential in shaping that ecosystem. And uh, other species benefit from that as well. I mean, it opens up forests. You get uh, uh, more uh, flowering uh, uh, bush species, uh, which means that you get more insects, more bird life, etc., and, and a, gr a bigger diversity of plant life. But the extrinsic value is that um, the traditional method of uh, um, caring for uh, natural resources in Europe is by mowing and uh, uh, clipping, etc., <laughs> which is, of course, in my opinion, is not nature, uh, of course. But it's, it's also financially not attractive to, uh, for governments to do anymore, uh, especially not in these economically hard times. So 
that's uh, why we say wildlife is capital. Why not uh, transplant the, uh, the idea that they have in Africa of maintaining uh, uh, ecosystems into Europe, which means that you set up uh, eco-tourism, uh, you set up safari tourism. What we're also missing in Europe is uh, some kind of uh, a lazy kind of eco-tourism. If you want to see your wildlife now in, a, in, in Europe, you need to climb mountains and hopefully you get a glimpse of a red deer or something like that. We need to restore animal populations to their natural densities, which in effect ma uh, means that you will get the same densities uh, like you have on the Serengeti like now. I mean, that, that has all been researched. And um, uh, if you get big an uh, animal populations, then uh, people will start to uh, make safaris, etc. And that's the, the second thing that you need to do, set up safari-based tourism and the whole uh, touristic infrastructure that you need to, uh, to, uh, to, to facilitate the people. Okay, and then I have a, f a few uh, uh, future uh, images, maybe. The, this the Danube Delta, you know, in Romania, where uh, oh, the big uh, Danube uh, uh, it, it ends up in the Black Sea. You have a big delta, and just imagine seeing uh, herds of uh, 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 wild water buffalo and red deer and uh, wild horses. I mean, it would be fantastic. Uh, I mean, now it's depleted of wildlife uh, almost, at least seeable wildlife. And here you could have uh, the large uh, uh, herds back. And another one would be the park like uh, landscapes, like I just talked about. I mean, this actually is uh, Cane Nature Reserve, where we started our first uh, Taurus uh, breeding herd. And uh, you have wild horses and uh, wild cattle. The, the thing that you do not see is, uh, is, uh, is uh, red deer and, uh, and roe deer and other animals. But at least well, it will get you an idea about uh, what I'm talking about. And on the bottom right, it is a safari I made with my little son. And one of, <laughs> of the cows just stared into our uh, window, car window. So, I should say, take action for wildlife today. <laughs> and that's it.